First of all, let me uh, apologise because I haven't been here all day. I would ideally have, have liked to, to have been here. Um, to just, I just want to set one or two things out sort of straight at the beginning. Um, when I spoke to you this morning, I, I did try and say to you, look, I, I've got no axe to grind in, in doing this. But the one thing I'm absolutely clear about, and I was, I hope, really explicit in the interim report, those of you who had a chance to read it, that my review of pensions is not going to be a race to the bottom. I've made that absolutely clear. And I have also made it clear, and you know, this has been a very interesting sort of expression of views. I've been to many other audiences and many other groups to say, why are you keeping defined benefit in the public sector? We have lost it in the private sector. And my argument has been to those people who've made that point to me. I see my work as trying to contribute to setting a good standard overall for public and private sector pensions. So my starting point in this review is not that we should exit from defined benefit. The starting point for my review is how do we retain defined benefit in the public sector? Now that's the, the exam question I've got to deal with. Now, I, I know enough from my time as a member of parliament that often my constituents didn't like having to make difficult choices. They didn't see the reason for a difficult choice at all. We just want to carry on as we are. Now, the one thing that I have learned in this review, looking at not just what's happened in the public sector here, but in the private sector here, and in the public sector and private sectors around the world, or in any country, that thinks that no change at all is the sensible option. No. I know change is physically resisted. It is. No one likes change. And someone said earlier that pensions is an emotional subject. They are, because it's about our future. So maybe the other thing I should make quite clear at this point, and I'm sorry again if I didn't at the beginning, it might have helped the day. Pension promises that have been made should be honoured. I don't think really for me that is even a sort of a question to be contested. I can say that not just as a, as a former politician, but, but as, a, as a lawyer as well. I've got a legal team with me. What you paid, what you paid for is... Yours. I'm not proposing, and I again made this clear in my entry report, that I'm going to take that away. That would be wrong, legally, morally, in every sense wrong. Because the one problem is to make, leaving aside the difficult choices that I, I believe very strongly have to be made. Why do I think they have to be made? Because our society and our economy is changing. Look around, see how it is changing. We, we cannot say we cannot divorce our pension system from the world of work and from the changes in our society. People are living longer, people are working, are beginning now to work longer too. And I, I doubt very much whether it is sustainable, as we have tried to do before, to say, well, we'll just do all the change for the new people who sell. And everyone who's in, going forward, well, there's going to be no change for us. I mean, we've all got kids, many of us here will have kids. I've got four kids, some of them work in the NHS, some in the public <coughs> I can't look at it and say, uh, I'm going to be fine, but you have to pay the price coming behind us. So we can do things for the new entrants, but no, nothing is going to touch, nothing is going to change us. I believe very strongly that's unfair. I do not believe that is a deal that we can sell to the country and sell to those people who are co-financing your pensions as well as yourselves. It is a co-financing deal. So I believe very strongly in, in, that there is a case for looking at change constructively from the point of view of keeping defined benefit, but not be naive that we can somehow go on forever without even contemplating the concept of change. All of your trade unions, those of you who are in trade unions, have already agreed with the last government that there will be what are called cap and share arrangements going forward. So if it looks like longevity is rising more than we thought, or other changes have affected the viability of those schemes, and every pension benefit has to be paid for, there is no sort of pot of money that doesn't exist here that no one has to contribute to. It's a cost. Every cost has to be met. Your unions have already agreed to share the cost between government and, and, and taxpayers. So implicit in what has been done in the last 10 years has been the recognition of change. And the possibility, and I don't put it any stronger than that, that costs might rise over and above what we have made provision for. And if they do, someone has to pay that. And at the moment, what has happened because we didn't have cap and share in, in recent years, is that the extra years that people are living for, 
great news, has not been paid for. Bad news. And because those benefit, benefits, pension benefits, are going to be paid, because that is right, the taxpayer is meeting those additional unfunded costs. <coughs> now, I just say, as my instinct, it's going to be my name on the report, not yours, don't worry about it. You will all be able to test and campaign against it, I'm sure some of you will. But I believe very strongly that we can't sustain that kind of arrangement going forward either. There's one thing that's probably going to be more fatal for trying to build public support for defined benefit schemes. That is what I want my report to do. There will be any built-in sense of unfairness around who's paying for what. The, the, the lack of transparency, the obscurity around who pays for what in public service schemes. So that's difficult stuff to do. But again, I just want to remind you, my mission here is not to see the end of defined benefit, it's to see the future of defined benefit in the public services. Two very final points. <clears throat> I've heard a lot of concern about career ravage, and my colleagues were telling me that a lot of people are worried about career ravage. Again, career ravage schemes have been introduced in the public sector with agreement with the trades union. <coughs> and I think the one thing that does frustrate me when people say to me, well, career ravage is crap, it's going to be worse than what we've got. The one thing I think it's very, very important to understand, and my report isn't actually going to set the, the envelope here, because it's not my job, I'm not a minister for government to decide how much they want to invest. Career average schemes can deliver really good benefits to, to scheme members. It depends what <coughs> the inputs are, where the contribution rates are set, what the benefit levels, what the accrual rates are. All of those things, and this is my final point, all of those things are going to have to be discussed with the trades unions in the proper way. So my report, when it comes out in a few weeks' time, is not the end of the process. It will be the beginning of the process of discussion and negotiation. And those of you, again, who are in trade unions, or trade unions will take positions, that is fine. That's the sort of society we live in. Thank goodness we have the opportunity to do those sorts of things. So this is not, as the gentleman here at the front said, a done deal. Nothing's a done deal. I'm only recommending change. The government has to consider it, and then there has to be a negotiation about what, how generous or otherwise these schemes would be. That is not my job to do. I can't do that. What I'm concerned about is the overall viability going forward looking for the next 30 or 40 years looking ahead. There was a, some figures published just, just recently which reminded me of the importance of this. And for those who said during the course of the day, well, longevity could go the other way. It's possible. Highly, highly likely. A third of all the girl babies born today, today in London and around the country in Britain, in Britain as a whole, just this country, a third of those young girl babies will reach the age of 100. And the total population of people over the age of 100 in Britain today will go from 12,000 to 500,000. Now that is the best evidence that we have about what's happening in our society. And if we get to a point where people are spending the majority of their adult life in retirement, that is going to be a very serious <coughs> problem for long-term viability of our pension schemes. So I said again at the beginning, look, it's not a nice problem to have to deal with, but it does not go away if we don't talk about it, if we don't look and discuss the options honestly and frankly between us. That's what I want my report to do. I want it to be a part of an ongoing process and people will come to it and think about it and say what they want to. So, look, thank you. Uh, we probably don't agree on quite a lot, but thank you for coming today. Your views are important to me and I've heard a very strong reflection of where you are and what you think about the future. And just let me remind you, pension promises that have been made to you should be honored. And that's what I'll be saying in my report. Thank you.